Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II. Good evening or morning, wherever you are. And I apologize. I'm a bit distracted today because I'm expecting a delivery of sausages and bacon and cheddar cheese from Ireland. So if my eyes go off there, uh, that's what I'm, I'm thinking about this morning. But anyway, we are continuing in what is now going to be three parts about Soviet losses in World War II with my uh, guest expert, Nigel Lasky. So I'm going to bring him straight in because we're going to not beat around the bush today. We're going to go straight into the presentation, but I'll bring Nigel in. Um, good evening, Nigel. How are you today? Hi, Paul. I'm good. Thanks. So we got up yesterday as far as um, uh, we're talking about we did the how uh, the statistics were, were taken, how they evolved over the years, the various versions that the bit we kind of left it at was um, the Soviet POW aspect. And that was something that you'd said right at the beginning was the the area that was the most kind of ambiguous and difficult to pin down. So. So we'll we'll tackle that today, and then we'll finish off again tomorrow. So um, I'll I'll put your PowerPoint app on screen there. So if you just kind of recap where we'd got to, and then we can start off talking about the, the POW aspect. Yeah. So basically, um, we've just been we've just been talking about uh, military records and and uh, double counting, and then before that, we just discussed the NKVD. Um, so today we're just gonna I'm just gonna cover twelve slides today. Everybody will be glad to know. <laughs> Um, so we're going to just focus on POWs, then I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the strategic operations and we'll cover equipment losses and how that might correlate to, uh, to, to personnel losses. So we're just going to cover those three topics and then tomorrow we'll finish with uh, the, uh, federal, uh, the Russian Federal Archive files and um, a new revaluation of the, of the total losses and then just some comments about maybe comparing with some of the German losses and Oh yeah, and we might just cover demographic losses. So, okay, and just, this, and just to this, say, we got a couple of comments we got Nigel about yesterday was what at what point are you going to address uh, the accuracy of the German statistics? Because we've you know we've covered kind of where the the, the Soviet shortcomings are, but obviously the German uh, side of things perhaps better, but still not not perfect in terms of how sure, they compile sure. their data. Well, that's right, and but the the only element of the German statistics we're going to use in this this study is POWs. Right. So every everything else, ir, all the other irrecoverable losses, wounded, sick, everything else is from Russian sources. Um, but the only area that we'll we'll be using is German POWs to to get a, a handle on 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 POWs because, as I'm going to do just now, you'll you'll find that this the the current Russian official story is is a is a is a very complex mishmash of, of bits okay. and pieces um anyway let's start with soviet POW. so um you know on the 11th of december uh hitler addressed the reichstag uh and it was it was basically the same speech in which he declared war on the us and in that speech he announced that uh the wehrmacht had captured uh, 3.8 million soviet soldiers destroyed 21,000 tanks, roughly 33,000 artillery pieces and, set, and approximately 17,000 aircraft. So um, that was the, 5th, the 11th of December. And then on the uh, 20th of December, the OKH reduced the, uh, the figure by 500,000, 539,000 exactly, to bring, to bring the German claim to about 3.3 million. Now, since that time, for about 30 years, people pretty much dismissed all the uh, the uh, figures that Hitler presented in that, although they were from an OKH report. He did make them up. And um, he basically, well, for 20 years, those figures were disputed. Now, the equipment figures, the 21,000 tanks, 33,000 artillery, they were also written off by, by most people. Um, and then in 1993, the Krivoshev uh, study became public. And as we'll see, the, the, the German uh, figures on equipment is incredibly accurate, surprisingly accurate. It's actually slightly understated, in fact. So the question then is, well, are the, are the POW figures uh, incorrect to that degree as well? And um, in the Krivoshev study released in 93, they sort of admitted the, the, the equipment figures, tanks, artillery, aircraft were were pretty good, but they've never allowed, they've never uh, basically admitted to the 3.3 uh, million POWs in 1941. So that does seem strange, but in a convoluted way, they do get to 3.3 uh, 3 million, but they, they use a, a mishmash, if you like, of, of, of different elements of the study to bring it together. So it does make 
it does make it really difficult to to really get a handle on POWs in the Kurvichev study. And I, I went through the study with a fine tooth comb to find everything I could find on POWs. And I consolidated this, all the things I found into this table. Um, so basically, um, the first five items on this table, straight out of Krivichev table one, um, and basically it's the number who, that were repatriated, which is obviously from Russian sources. Um, then the peers that died, uh, those that were killed in captivity and so on. The ones who immigrated are ones that the, the Soviets said immigrated, but of course, you know, whether they immigrated or just didn't want to go back to Russia because they'd be killed, um, which is another discussion, you know, is up for debate. And then they've just plonked in POWs whose fate is unknown, 125. So you get this 3.1 million POWs. Now, he actually calls them POWs. So he, he says, these are all POWs. Um, so this is for the whole war. Then in the Krivish Shift study, now on table one, I don't know if you remember, there's this 939,700 who are missing in occupied territories, but later rejoined the, the uh, or rejoin the Red Army, apparently. Um, so he's classified them in table one as MIAs and not POWs. But then later in the Krivoshev study, he talks about 4.59 million POWs. And he again uses the term POWs. So suddenly these MIAs have suddenly become POWs, um, which then contradicts, um, you know, the first, the first statements around Table One. Um, now, this nine thirty nine seven hundred that were that were actually um, missing, if you like, is is a very controversial area because the Germans did release uh, three hundred thousand, uh, three hundred eighteen thousand POWs in nineteen forty one, and Krivichev actually states that he actually states that later in the book, and you can see it at the bottom of the table there, um, and then in between sort of mid 42 and 1st of May 44, the Germans released another 504,000 POWs. Now, I'm going to come to the word released, but Krivichev again verifies that. So he, he's, they basically are using the German sources there, they make those statements. So the figure of uh, 504, the 318,000 released, I'm not sure why they released them. Maybe, that, maybe they decided they were not uh, combatants or um, they were they were planning to try and use them into to to create combat units because I've actually found out that of that three hundred eighteen thousand, two hundred seventy seven thousand were actually Ukrainians. Now there was a strong Ukrainian, a pro Nazi Ukrainian movement in in uh, Ukraine at that time, and the Germans were thinking maybe I, this is my theory. I don't know for sure. They were thinking maybe we can you can use those to to form some local Ukrainian units to, uh, you know, to, to do behind the line security stuff in Ukraine, or maybe even frontline service. Now the 500,000 that were released here in 44, they were mostly um, given the option, they were either incredibly ill and disabled and they were probably at death's door, or they were put into Hiwi, you know, they became the Hiwis, the helpers, if you like. So they actually were given, uh, they weren't Wehrmacht uniforms, they were special uniforms, but, you know, could identify them as part of the German armed forces. And they were they were basically used for second line, you know, cooking, uh, courier work, and, and you know, credit, it's, I mean, the, the, the Russian soldiers were facing a terrible dilemma, really. I mean, they could either pretty much starve to death in POW camps, or they could, you know, Try and survive by becoming one of these um, these helpers for the Germans. Mm. Um, not many went. Not many of them went into combat units at all. But in um, in 1940 uh, in 1945 um, the Germans did release. I think it was 44, late 44, 45. They released another 200,000 who were actually. Uh, maybe they were selected or they'd volunteered. They did be, actually join Wehrmacht units. And they become, uh, I don't know, they call them the Ostrip and Eastern Legion. Um, I don't know, they, some of them were formed uh, into, you know, local uh, national units, but most of them were, were used as replacement into, into these, uh, you know, Eastern Legion units. Their combat capabilities have 
you know, was stemmed from the fact that if the Russians found them in German uniforms, they were pretty much executed. Same with Hueys. Hueys, uh, um, they wouldn't have much life expectancy if the Red Army captured them, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. So when Krivichev talks about you know, 939,000 uh, being liberated, my research has indicated that that number was at best 160,000. Right. Um, so he's saying 939,000 were MIA, which he later says are POWs. But again, he's trying to get to this 4559 number. So later on in the study, we find I found this statement, servicemen killed on the battlefield but listed as MIAs. That just came out of left field. And I have no idea why that is not put into um, irrecoverable MIA or, or just killed because he basically, this is, this is where I'm talking about reverse engineering. He's basically trying to get that 4059 number to this 4559 number. Now, if you remember back on table one, that 455 number is the number of total number of MIAs and POWs going way back to the 1988 memorandum. And it's, it's, you know, it's beyond uh, possibility that, that it's exactly the same number as presented to the Soviet Politburo in 1988. It just doesn't yeah. add up. So again, he's now admitting, okay, at various points in the book, we've got to 4559 potential POWs. Um, and then later on, he says roughly 2,500 died in captivity, which is probably, you know, actually a bit low. But anyway, the point is that suddenly um, his figure previously uh, was that only 959,000 died, which is only 21%. So you can see that the, sorry, 978,000 died. So. You can see the Ludus Rigolo assessment here. In the original figures, he's saying 978,000 POWs died, i.e., that's, that's the 4559. But now he's saying later on, oh, well, actually, two and a half million died. So it's, it's really, you know, a convoluted mishmash of, 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 uh, of, of data. Now, this is, why, this is why I keep going back to the German POW data, because I've not found any real evidence that German POW data is not is not uh, not not deadly accurate, but not bad, and certainly right. a lot better a lot better than than I'm getting um, from from you know Russian sources at the moment. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and we'll talk about this tomorrow on the, the the archive files, is the archive files agree much more closely with with the German uh, figures than they do with 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 what's coming out of the Krivichev study. So that's another reason that you know we may we may you know the the Nazi, Nazism was a heinous regime, but Sadly, they still had a world-class, um, uh, you know, military staff. And, yeah. and and one of the reasons we know so much about the atrocities carried out by the Wehrmacht um, is because they kept meticulous records of it. You know, the, the Germans thought they were going to win the war and there was going to be no consequences. And so they kept they kept records of all this. Um, and, you know, all the German records were, were obviously available at the end of the war because um, all the German archives became microfilmed and sent to the US and, and distributed around Europe. So that's why the German records are you know, completely open. There's no reason for the Germans to exaggerate POW losses. Why would they exaggerate POW losses if they don't exaggerate equipment losses? It, you know, it just makes no sense. They also, you know, they were professionals. They wanted to, they wanted to get a real handle on how many POWs they'd taken because they, they, they wanted to make an assessment of how much damage they've done to the Red Army. What they didn't know, of course, is, you know, the mobilization process that was going on and how big the, you know, the uh, reserve forces were that they were, they were going to be facing in the winter and so on. So despite these losses, um, you know, the Russians were still able to put two and a half million men into the field in, in, in December 1941. Mm, we just got the question about um, from World War II analyze about any chance the Wehrmacht undercounted in '41 to hide Soviet POW deaths. Um, during the war, I, I, I don't know. To be honest, I, I, it's possible. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, whether they deliberately undercounted POWs to hide. Um, I don't think they cared. 
to be honest. So I don't think they they would have hit it or not. I don't think it would have been on their horizon. Um, maybe maybe later on in 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 uh, post war accounts, maybe. Um, <coughs> I think I'm with you. I mean, when we had Wayne yeah. Leon on yesterday evening talking about, you know, the open policy the Germans had the, of, of, you know, killing outright Red Army officers early on in the war and all this is I can't see that they have any reason to, to cover up. that they, they don't care. They're openly going around yeah, I mean, their policy. Look, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question. Um, I haven't seen any evidence the Germans undercounted POWs, though. So okay. the answer is... Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, ultimately, yeah, I, when we I said this at the beginning of yesterday's show, you, although your your analysis of this data you have is incredible, and you've you've used all the skills you have brought to it to analyze it, you're starting to some extent with imperfect data, right? I mean, we we can't know for certain. No, eighty years on, that we're starting with exactly the correct figures. It's only a it's it's a it's the best we can do with what we've got, and that that's 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 how that's the situation we're in. I'm guessing, isn't it? That that's a pretty good. Uh, guess yeah i mean there's a huge amount of data and and um, some of it's accurate and some of it isn't and i mean it's a bit like uh it's a bit like creating a jigsaw puzzle i mean this, that's the, the way i think of it is yeah. you know if you if imagine you've got a you know a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and you know 400 well no 300 pieces are missing but you still want to build a picture yeah. so you, you you can build a pretty good picture of what the jigsaw puzzle is you know the final picture but you're never gonna you're never gonna get the file because there are there's, there's just too many pieces missing and as you said at the beginning of yesterday um, it's the it's the it's the correlating the information from different locations it's cross-checking the medical reports with, with yeah, personal reports yeah. so that you can achieve this it's when people talk about the age of the earth don't they it's not just carbon dating they use yeah. all these different systems and they all say the same thing so i suppose in this regard if the figures from one way of classifying the figures match up more or less with the figures from another another means you can exactly. be fairly so sure that they're, they're in the same area yes that's 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 right i mean okay. uh, what's an analogy an analogy is i don't know someone says there's a thousand car deaths in you know a particular state in a month, and then you find out that only you know ten thousand people have got a license in that state. Then you'd say, "Well, hang on a minute, that doesn't sound right," because that you know ten percent of people wouldn't have a car accident in one month. So you see the two data streams; they don't match. Right. So you yeah. get a lot of this, you know. Um, and we'll when we look at equipment losses, we'll that that'll become apparent because that's another data stream, which you know okay. we can try to 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 match. Now, look, these are these are these are the German figures. So. Um, the figures on the on the left are basically uh, from OKH uh, headquarter report. So they, they they basically accumulated figures that were fed into the to the war machine as as the as the war went on. Um, now what I've done, um, so I've I've obtained this data from uh, Schustrist. Uh, he he published a. Um, a very comprehensive study of this in 1988. So I've actually taken taken that data from from his work, and what I've done is I've put on the on the right side the main pockets and and the dates when they were liquidated. On the on the right, so people you can get a real impression now of 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 the losses in each month due to the um, to the pockets, and how they was accumulating the POWs across the year. Now in um, on the 20th of uh, December, they dropped the uh, the POWs. The OK said we've overcounted. Well, this was their official statements. We said we've overcounted. We've we've done some double counting, and we've also uh, put in some civilians in there. So we're going to drop the number of POWs by roughly half a million. So I don't know. You know, going back to that previous point, maybe maybe they maybe they did that to <laughs> to hide the fact later on that you know there were most of these POWs weren't going to survive. I don't. Think that I think they were just doing some admin, you know, checkups. I don't. I'm not that cynical that I that I thought they were doing that to, to hide losses or anything, mm. to hide POW deaths or anything. Anyway, the by the by the end of December, the 30th of December, this was the number here, three seven uh, three three seven eight, um, and as you can see, of that two five four nine are all in these these major pockets. Um, the main thing is that at every point in the sequence, the number of 
of people in the pockets uh, doesn't exceed the accumulated total. So you're always going to have small actions where you're getting small groups of POWs. So if the, if the numbers in the pockets exceed the accumulated total, you know there's something wrong, because um, you know uh, that that should be impossible. So the main thing here is that the accumulated totals are always ahead of the number in the pockets, quite quite significantly ahead. So you know that that in fact, even though most of the POWs were captured in pockets, I think it was about seventy. Was it? 75%. So 75% of the POWs in this table came from these major pockets, which is about right, actually. Um, you know, when you when you when you think of the scale of the operation, so there would have been a lot of small tactical pockets and, and so on that, that surrendered and so on. Um, obviously, the two really big ones are the Kiev pocket. And mm -hmm. we'll talk well, if you want it later on, we'll talk a bit about that. And and the Viesma Brins pocket. So until about only about 10 years ago, the Kiev pocket was considered the biggest single pocket of POWs ever created in military history. And then thanks to a whole bunch of work by some Russian scholars, which has been published in the last 10 years, we now know that in fact, the Viesma Brinks pocket, which was from Operation Typhoon, was in fact the biggest single pocket of POWs ever created in military history. So that's, you know, that's, that's, uh massive numbers really uh, what else did i want to say about that oh yeah just uh, just wanted to say that you know this is 336 3378 um so the official german uh history with these books i've got behind me they're all the official german history they're from the research institute at potsdam and um freeberg so the this is the the german uh governments position, they've come up with a figure of 3350. So it's very close to to this 3378. And there's another guy, American, who published a very comprehensive work called Dallin in 1957. Um, he, he, he did a lot of detail on this as well. He came up with a figure of 3355. So, you know, they're all in that ballpark figure. Um, so that's, um, that's good. Mm. So any questions? Keep going. No, I'm good. Man. I think we're, 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 it's, it's good. It's it's solid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keep going. Right. So so basically, um, do you think of the, the question about the authenticity of the German POWs and 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 are you happy with that, or shall I talk a bit more about? Well, that? I'm happy with that. I think. Yeah. No. Let, let's um, let's let's keep going. We can do some questions at the end. Um, no. I'm right because. Yeah, because you, you can see why, why I've had to use German POW figures because I, c I just can't use the Russian ones. They, they're just all over the place. Um, and I've got no real reason to doubt the German figures. So what I've done here is I've decided, okay, let's merge this data. So so we, we basically, the top part of the table, this is this is Krivoshev data and taking Street's POW data. So the Street, I didn't mention him. He's, he's Professor Christian Street. He, from the University of Heidelberg, published... Uh, um, a very comprehensive analysis of all the uh, uh, German and Soviet POWs in, 19, in 1978, um, and so I'm using his data to 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 basically um, bring the you know the, the, all the war data from Krivichev and all and all the PO data for the Germans together. So at the top, anything with a star, that's all from original from the Krivichev data. That's from Table One. Um, he basically talks about uh, these ones being uh, seriously wounded remained on the battlefield again. He's you know this MIA is a, <laughs> you know they these MIAs you can either died or really mainly POWs. So he, there's this 1,000 figure now at the moment. Um, this is a relatively low estimate, but there's no way way at the moment of historically co corroborating that little bit of data there accurately because mm. Krivichev has produced these approximate 500,000 figures and you know um, I think there were probably POWs but I can't actually confirm that so then we've got these MIAs who avoided captivity um, and yeah they've already been counted 159 counted so they're double counted but uh, jumping to the German stuff the green stuff is is this stuff from street, which is I guess so. That's all Russian information. So it, the green stuff is German information. So street basically comes up with a total figure of 5.8 million German 
uh, sorry, uh, Soviet POWs during the war. Now, the uh, the Romanians captured about 120,000, um, and they handed most of those, well, not most of a, a big chunk of those over to the Germans. The Hungarians captured the numbers, but they they just they didn't uh, hold them in camps. They they handed them over to the Germans. The Finns didn't hand any over to the Germans. They kept their POWs uh, in Finland, and they weren't treated well either. I have to say, the the the, the you know, a third of roughly a third of the Finnish prisoners also died. Mm. Did the just while you're taking a sip of water? Did the Soviets or indeed the Germans ever during World War Two have a definitive system for when an MIA was classified as something else because we British and Canadians Americans had systems that evolved in the Pacific and the ETO at a certain number of days after a certain amount they would say okay this person is now going from being MIA to 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 lost presumed so did did, they, did the Soviets and Germans have such a system yeah yeah it would have been it would have been just a couple of weeks right yeah yeah no they if you didn't come back in in a couple of weeks you were considered and yeah. is that was that as an individual or were units? Because obviously, in, with the volume we're talking about here, entire entire units could just kind of go missing because they were overrun. So, did the Soviets, for example, do have a different system for writing off a unit as they did individuals, or was it all kept in the same kind of ballpark area? Um, well, I can only I can only talk about some of the rifle divisions. So, when the, when the Germans captured some of the, uh, the rifle divisions in the pockets. Um, the rifle division was completely wiped out and right. the the russians would still carry it on their order of battle for up to two months they, they would and then it would just if you look at the russian oob lists it just disappears after a couple of months um so remnants of the division often came you know would escape through the lines and, and sometimes a division Sometimes, you know, in the chaos of Barbarossa, a Russian division would actually disappear, would lose communication um, because it was isolated. And then some headquarter units and some of the cadre would get through, you know, if 10,000 men, maybe 2,000 men would get out. So they would still keep the divisional de designation. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Russians carried them on their OOB for, you know, you know, up to a couple of months. But eventually, if 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 the division was literally destroyed to a man or, you know, only five percent was left. They they just disband the division or right. disband the regiment, and it would be merged into other you know units. In terms of individual men in in the Red Army, I, I'm not sure how long they would wait. Um, there's a, the Red Army. I have to you know when you're talking about the Red Army in 1941 in particular, you've got to realize that they were they were mobilizing millions of men, and yeah. a lot of the men weren't even registered. They were, they didn't even have dog tags. So this yeah, is I mean that, that's that's where I mean I, I'm coming at this from that ETO point of view. When I, you know, if yeah. I'm researching when a soldier joined the 101st Airborne, there are morning reports that say when yeah, he joined no, the unit, like, when he left the unit, so on and so forth. And you can you can build up a pretty solid picture for 99% of the personnel. But obviously, with the service yeah. you said there, especially in the early war, it's a very very different um, well, system. See, when we look at the TSMO files tomorrow, there are files of people that you know they they they. They were the the, polit the uh, political commissar of a military district. Say, yeah, you're joining the Red Army, and so that was registered. But that person would then go off, and they just never came home. So mm -hmm. they, you know, they say, okay, he was either killed or a POW. And then if they can find some other references in those files to his military service, then they can confirm that. But um, just a quick thing on dog tags. You know, one of the the, the in the American Army they have the double uh, disc dog tag. I think, and in the German one, they you know they have the uh, the metal clip that breaks yeah. up, up. Well, in the Red Army, they really didn't have anything in, uh, but they did start with these little. Uh, I think there were sort of tubes. I'm not sure if they were plastic or whatever, and they had a little piece of paper in with a stopper. <laughs> and a lot of a lot of Red Army soldiers refused to to put their name and address on this this piece of paper because they thought it was a bad omen. You know, this is this is, wow. this is where, and of course, this was really not a good solution because the you know water ingressed this tube, you know it got destroyed anyway. So a lot of soldiers, when they were found, you know the corpses found on the battlefield, there was no way of identifying them. And I mean, this sounds brutal, but you know, if, if, at least for for soldiers in the West, you know you could identify who they were, even if you ca you know you got hold of the. So even even in cases where the Russians were actually winning the battlefield afterwards, and they find you know bodies. 
they, they couldn't identify them. And it, it was so bad that in November 1942, the, German, the, the, Russia, the Soviets just said, ah, oh, it's just a waste of time. We won't even bother with these anymore. So, mm. <laughs> you know, well, I think it's just um, worth stating that because the majority of our viewers are, are English speaking. They're in America, Canada, Britain, Australia, and they're coming at this with the with the knowledge they have. A lot of them are, are veterans of, of modern wars, modern service, and they're thinking the system that is used then yeah, by the it, Soviets it, 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 has yeah. some kind of comparison to the system they know about themselves. I and mean, I think it's just worth pointing out that it is very, very different. And that's yeah. At the start again it's that start the starting point of information the information the data stream is less detailed less less perfect from from the very beginning anyway yeah um so um street also said that uh, he 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 estimated that roughly a thousand pows were released by the by the uh, germans during the war which is again this 203000 in 41 500 uh, up to 44 and so on. So he then calculated that roughly uh, uh, 3.2.8 million. Right. Yeah, I think hmm. was, 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 um, no, 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 it was, sorry, I'm a bit. Uh, So yeah, he said he said roughly um, 3.3 million were, were died in captivity. So that that figure is kind of the one that's used pretty much now, um, you know, in most most sources on on this subject. But um, what Street didn't know was that approximately 1,000 1.8 million went back into uh, return to the USSR. So he wouldn't have had access to this data. So I've plugged that in here, and also this 180,000 here, which is you see the star and the uh, and the uh, little sign there. They indicate that's Krivoshev data. So that's new data Street didn't have access to. So when you when you plug that in, it says three three million survived captivity, and remember, approximately one million of them were were basically um, you know used by the Germans in various ways. So that means that. On this data, 49.1% of all um, German-held POWs died in captivity or were killed in captivity. And then you add the Finns and, and the Ra Romanian ones, you come up with roughly 48.3%. So Street's sort of saying, well, about 55% using the Kuvachev data to say, well, a few more went back, 48%. So it's still between 2.8 million and 3.3 million Soviet soldiers died in captivity. So it's, you know, it's a mini Holocaust, basically. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's, um, that's the numbers. Yeah. And other, yeah. other people know a lot more about, you know, what happened to those, to those men than, than I do. But yeah, the numbers do back that up. Okay, thank you. Um, right. So let's just, uh, I just want to talk now about the second item today, and that's that's uh, strategic operations during 1941. Um, so the, the Krivichev study is a, is a massive book, and one of the one of the biggest features of it is that it actually details losses for each of the major operations. And this is the bit of data that most historians who write books on on the Eastern Front use. Because they, they, do, they, I'm going to do a battle on, uh, you know, the defense of Odessa. Oh yes, this is the figure from Krivishev. and I have to say that um, most well-known Western authors use these numbers, and they haven't checked them. So I won't say any names, but they haven't checked them. <laughs> um, now, these. Am I getting feedback or something? Am I... There's um people cutting trees down over, over the road for me, so it's oh. a, there's a, there's there's noise oh, audio right. noise. That's sorry. I thought that was my 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 headphone. Yeah, no, I'm muting myself every now and then. It's it's very annoying. It's okay. So these two slides basically they they cover the the uh, strategic operations of 17 of the of the of the biggest operations in 1941. So these are the 17 operations shown in the Krivichev study for 1941. Now what I've highlighted in green are the are the ones that were decisive. Okay, 
Now, this is subjective, but these are the ones, these, these seven operations, the three border battles, the Battle of Smolensk, Kiev, which is, the Kiev operation is basically the whole battle in the, in the Ukraine for most of 1941, the, the uh, Moscow defensive operation, which is Operation Typhoon, um, and of course, the Soviet offensive, winter offensive from Moscow, which pushed the Army Group Center away from Moscow in December. So those um, seven battles are the, the, the decisive ones. And if we, we total up the casualties in there, based on the Krivishiv figures for total losses, roughly 75% of irrecoverable and 72% of total losses were in those seven engagements. Um, the problem is that if you then total those numbers up, it comes to you know 93%. So 93%, according to the Krivishiv, of all the casualties in 1940 occurred in those seven. So there's something wrong there. You can see that's the data stream that doesn't match. There's no way that only 7% of Russian casualties occurred in all these other battles. One of which, of course, is the defensive, the strategic defensive of Leningrad. So that includes, a, you know, the clearing of the Baltic states, the whole army group north, bloody fighting across the Luga River and encircling Leningrad. That's, I've classified as not decisive. It was still a massive operation. So even when you include that, all the defenses in, uh, you know, Moldavia and the battles around Odessa, if you use the Krivashiv data, you've only got 7% to play with. So there's a problem. So there's a mismatch between what Krivishiv is saying the casualties are in individual operations and his total numbers. So those, those total numbers there are taken from table two. You remember yesterday we did table two, the whole army and navy losses. Now, tomorrow I'll, we'll be doing a re-evaluation of Soviet losses and basically um, we're gonna be saying um, these are the losses based on, on the evidence that's, that, that I'll be presenting, around 6.4 million, not 4.4. So this includes all the POWs that, that are not accounted for in the Krivishiv study. And then if we, if we take the seven operations, you're getting a much more realistic. So we're basically saying those seven decisive operations inflicted 65% of all the casualties in 1941. That's in line with what we would expect with the data stream. So you can see this, the problem here. So let's take a look at, Battle of Smolensk. I'm, I'm going to pick this one here, Battle of Smolensk, and look at it in some detail. So according to Krivishev, this battle um, occur, incurred only 759,000 losses, including 486,000 irrecoverable. So irrecoverable is POWs and uh, killed. So um, We've got two historiographies happening here. In, in the, in the Krivishev data, it's, it goes from the 10th of July to the 10th of September. So that's two months. So that's a massive operation. Now, the other thing that's that's been bundled together is, is, is that the Battle of Smolensk is not really the Battle of Smolensk. It's really the entire campaign conducted by Army Group Center. Um, and so it, it you know includes this massive area all the way up to Veliliki, um, you know, just west of Ryza, Vyazma, the Western Dnieper River, the land bridge between Vitebsk and Orsha, all the way south down to Mogilev, and then all the way down to um, um, Romney, south of Brinsk. Now, if you do the numbers, um, you know, because I, I looked at this on a map and I, I measured this, it's 230 kilometers north of Smolensk, and almost a massive 460 kilometers south and east of Smolensk. So it's 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 actually into the Ukraine. So they're saying this battle in Belarus was so you know massive that it actually went into the northern Ukraine. So it's not a battle, it's a mini campaign. So what I'm saying is okay. If you're using the Russian historiography, then we need to take all these different battles that have, were fought in that time period in this area, and what are the numbers? Because those numbers don't appear in any of the other listings that Krivish is producing. You know, they only appear in the Battle of Smolensk. Um, so 
what was you know what was the start strength? So Krivoshev again. The other thing to say about the previous table is that the only the only information supplied is start strengths, which is this 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 uh, number here, numerical strength at start. Now that's not a lot of use because you really want to know what's what the start strength was. But some of these battles are going on for three months, so you really need to know how many troops arrived because in three months the, the Soviets can mobilize. 20 armies, you know, so that could be a million men arriving. So, so you really want to handle on start strength, but also on, on the um, total duration, you know, the, the strength in the duration, the total committed, if you like. You, you can't get that from the Kivashiv data. But all he gives you is this start strength, which is misleading because um, you'll find that, you know, the start strength often quadruples in the, in the case of the Russian numbers. So they, they might start with half a million, but they, you know, you're going to get one and a half million men involved in the whole battle. So that's what you really want is that figure. So starting, so I think, well, I so I calculated the Stavka reserve forces. So when the Germans defeated the Western Front in the in the um, frontier, they then advanced rapidly east, and and the the Soviets were forced to commit the um, Stavka reserves, which had about six hundred eighteen thousand men uh, in June forty one. So they committed not all of the Stavka reserves, but the vast bulk. That's, that include the 16th, 19th, 20th armies, with around 275,000, 24th, 22nd, 21st. As you see, I have the numbers here, 88,806. Um, and then 34,000 additional uh, corpse units were thrown in. At the same time, the Western Special Military District, which was now North, Western Front, because those they changed their name immediately on the day that the war started, they were retreating back. So they, they, this, they'd been smashed. They started the war. Um, you know, with, with around 670,000 men. By the 10th of July, that strength was down to 197,000. So th they were streaming back to the second line, the position, if you like, around Smolensk. So on the 10th of July, um, and if you add replacements, the 10th of July figure comes out at 883. So immediately, the start strength is wrong. With this Russian historiography, and I'm saying Russian, not Soviet, because this is the official Russian history, um, it wasn't 581, it was 883. Now, the battle went on for two months, as described by Glantz in his Barbarossa Derail series, two months using the Russian historiography. So in that time, if you, if you um, go into detail on each of the armies in the rifle division, you find that 11 new armies were mobilized and deployed into the line to, to hold it, basically. Um, and when you when you when you um, do the numbers, you come up with a figure of 1.4 million men committed, uh, just if you like, at the start strength of these forces when they arrive. So they arrive, they're in battle, but then they at the same time over the two month period they receive replacements. So replacements are arriving, and, and, and so at least half a million replacements are added. So when you when you get the final number, the, the 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 total Red Army soldiers committed to this battle, this mini campaign was was about 1.99 million men. Um, and of course, then that makes sense because how can they take the casualties we're going to look at in the next slide, and still have a million men left? And that's how it works. So if if you take you know we're already way above uh, of, of this 581. At the top, so we, we, so that's you know that's giving people a real handle on how big this battle really was, um, or I should say, mini campaign really was. So then we talk about casualties. Now, um, in the Krivoshev study, they come up with this this 486,000. Now that includes all POWs. So when you start doing the numbers of all the all the PO, all the pockets that, that existed in that area in this time frame. You come up with this 565,000 POWs. So that includes the Mogilev pocket, um, the Smelsk pocket, the main one, um, Roslavels. So these were all little battles. If you look at the um, the chronology of what happened, you'll you'll see that that these were you know, small encircling engagements, all involved around the Smelsk area. Um, so we were, you know, even with we, even with just POWs, we're already well above the 486. Hmm. Uh, um, so, in the German chronology, the German historiography, 
they talk about the battle ending on around um, 5th, 6th of August. And the reason is because the Battle of Smansk in the German historiography was the second phase of their attack towards Moscow. So the first phase was the encirclement, the border battle of Belostok Minsk. As far as Army Group Center was concerned, in the pre-war plan, Smolensk uh, approaching Vyazma was the second leap, if you like, and the third was going to be Moscow. Now, when Hitler ordered uh, his directive number uh, 33, I think in July, early uh, 13th July, he ordered the third panzer group to uh, assist army group north um, keeping one panzer corps around Veliliki and second panzer group was ordered to close the, the Kiev pocket to head south. Now in the Battle of Smolensk that German, the second panzer group's movement south which is a month of fighting and counterattacks by the Russians is, not, is, is included in the Battle of Smolensk. It's, so that's what I mean. It's you know, it's 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 like they've bundled this whole uh, two-month period and this whole area into this battle. And interestingly enough, Krivichev's figures um, actually are quite closely match the German historiography up to the fifth of August. Right. But then, but then they've added this extra month, all the way to um, to you know the tenth of September. So when you add that, plus all the movements of, of the third panzer group and the second panzer group, you have to add all these extra battles, which I've listed here, to to the to the uh, to the equation, including the you know the famous Elnia. There's two main offensive against the Elnia salient, both very bloody. They were part of the Battle of Smolensk, of course. So, you know, some estimates are that the Soviets suffered up to seventy-seven thousand casualties in that battle. Um, other ones. Only thirty-two thousand. So, I've basically said, okay, we, we'll we'll go through each of these engagements and we'll basically figure out, you know, um, how many how many casualties do we need to add to the to the to the total. So we've got these five sixty-five thousand. So up to from tenth uh, of July to sixth of August, Army Group Center inflicted eighty-six thousand killed, and then if you add the extra month with the Russian historiography, you had another 73,000 killed in all those, those, basically those eight engagements there. Um, so when you do that, you come up with this 724,000 irrecoverable losses. Wow. Well, it's so, reminding me, Nigel, that whenever we read a book or we're reading an internet article and, and someone defines a battle, or as you in your case, you're talking about the Smolensk being a campaign effectively, is that the reader of that may have a definite definition, definition in their head for what is meant by the battle than the reader or the person providing information has for it. And it, you know, it's that it's the setting the parameters and boundaries before you start your analysis. I think is the thing we're yeah, all kind of that's, learning. That's, isn't a, it? You that's know, a very good the, point. Yeah. There's the point that there's the art, there's the strength at the beginning, but then the fact there's, as you said, there are these reinforcements coming who aren't just dribs and drabs of you, and it's an entire divisions going up there. And, yep, you know, we yep. do it all the time. We read books and, we, and, and an author, a historian presents a definition of something and we just take it on board and we assume that in our head, our definition for that is the same as the author's. And, and what you're reminding us is that it, it, it may be completely different. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these battles, you know, run into each other. So one side in its its records might define the back of you know, the battle as ending on the 10th of July, whereas the other side def defines it as ending in, you know, 30th of July. So its figures will have an extra two weeks of, of, of data. Um, but this is an extreme case of, um, of that. I, I have to say, though, I'm a little bit more cynical in this case because I think this is deliberate. This, this, is, this, is, this is deliberate um, bundling it all into the Battle of Smolensk when really it should have probably, because um, the second panzer group's progress south was really assisting Army Group South and right. was really part of the Battle of Kiev. So, um, yeah, I have quite strong opinions about this because I think I think it's what's been done here is, I think people are then saying, well, um, the conclusion is therefore the Battle of Smolensk ended on the 10th of September, so the Germans couldn't possibly advance on Moscow until they'd finished the Battle of Smolensk, so they couldn't have advanced until October. That's the argument, mm, mm. and it's not a genuine argument because um, 
they're basically extending the parameters of the Battle of the Smolensk to such an extent, you know, when it when it's basically 200 kilometers into North Ukraine and, you know, it's it encompasses Veliliki in the far north and, you know, Third Panzer Group's efforts to assist Army Group North take Leningrad. You know, it's like, how extreme do you get to convince that this Battle of Smolensk hasn't ended yet? So I'm very cynical about the Battle of Smolensk Russian historiography. And um, the more I looked, the more I dug around, the less convinced I became that it's a genuine. Um, because what actually happened was right up until probably uh, Glantz's books, and Krivoshev and Glantz's books, most Western historians considered the Battle of Smolensk to have ended around the 5th or 6th of August. And uh, Guderian basically said to Hitler, you know, we'll be ready to launch an offensive against Moscow around 15th of August. And um, Hoth, third panzer group, was already, he was ready on basically 6th of August. He had six panzer motorized divisions rested, ready to go 6th, 7th August. When I say rested, that means for the German, for a panzer, in my book, I talk a bit about the structure of German panzer divisions. And a lot of people talk about German tank losses, but the German panzer divisions had quite sophisticated, well, they had very sophisticated uh, recovery and repair units, which traveled with the units. And also, um, because of the structure of German panzer divisions, they only needed about 30% of their tanks operational, and they became offensive units. Right. We could, what, what, when, when you when you don't call me, want me to come back one day, I can talk all about the structure of the German panzer divisions, why they were so resilient. Because even though they took very heavy yes, tank please. losses, you know, they, they basically could keep going. So one of the reasons, for example, that German motorized divisions were so offensive, were effective, and they didn't even have tanks, is because of this. Um, so um, I've got I've, I've digressed, but the, the point I'm saying is that there's a whole debate still about you know could the German army advance on Moscow, and this Russian historiography fits into that 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 debate. No, definitely, and I mean what you're saying about the, the losses in this battle. I mean it, you know we I think I said at the beginning of yesterday's show is that you can write about the outcome of a battle without necessarily getting your figures right because it's your interpretation of the of the strategic. Um, achievements would remain the same regardless of the losses. But in terms of the opinions, I mean, I mean, as a, as a nominee guy, I'm, I'm, I'm going down the rabbit hole now. Our understanding, for example, of Operation Goodwood has got much better because of understanding what the actual losses were, because the early way of interpreting it of whether it was 350 Allied tanks lost was that they are lost irreplaceably but in fact we now understand that a lot of those were back in action the next day or replaced by new units and so and so and so forth so our understanding of that battle has refined because the data we're right. asset accessing yeah. is 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 more accurate so the same would apply here those people who are writing about the, the eastern front the, the better the data you start from the the more accurate your conclusions about the the, um, the 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 margins between a battle being a victory, a loss, a draw, a, a tactical withdrawal can be can be more accurately achieved. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a good point. Look, I, I just want to put, just point out this this little table at the bottom here was uh, these this is the German records of Army Group centers uh, equipment and personnel captured, and um, so basically, you know, they were they were. Stating we we uh, we captured about a million uh, POWs uh, up to the 27th of September, and then I've broken that down into the uh, the, the components, if you like, that would fit mm. the uh, the narrative that I'm I'm putting here. Again, it, it's just another data stream that does it fit the the pattern, right. and yep, it does. The, the, you know, the Battle of Smolensk using the Russian historiography, Army Group Center can 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 rack up 565,000 POWs which is pretty much uh, in line with the 1 million they claimed in that in that period and the pockets so it's like you know okay that's that's uh, that's uh, that fits and you know it's interesting there's there's 8000 tanks there as well so um, that's a, you know that's a huge number of tanks that that they've uh, they've they've well captured in this case but they probably would have been disabled or damaged tanks you know um so yeah and destroyed tanks all right so um we come to 
the next slide, which basically takes in the middle there, I've got the Battle of Smolensk, the third one down. So on the left side, you see the Krivoshev data. And on the right, the green, you see the data from revision or, uh, you know, new information, if you like. Now, I did most of the work on the Battle of Smolensk, but the other battles have come from Russian authors and Russian researchers. So um, basically, um, for the for the uh, Baltic operation, for example, um, there's a Russian uh, author called Ivlev, um, and he did a lot of work in this. He's done a lot of research on the uh, Northern Front operations, and he actually found astonishingly that out of the 78 units initially employed in Northwestern Front, only 40 submitted a, a lost report. Do you, so yesterday I said, that what Krivoshev admitted to was that if a report didn't arrive, they basically just said, oh, well, we, you know, we just, we don't do anything. And uh, in August, he found that only 40 of 216 organization units in Northwestern Front submitted a loss report. So you can see there's a massive difference between the Baltic uh, defensive strategic operation Krivichev figures and the new report. So Ivlev then did a, an analysis based on the strengths of the units and how that strength changed over time. And he came up with these with these numbers. Um, so again, for the, uh, for the Moscow, for example, the Moscow strategic defensive operation, I've got the book here. This was another Russian author. Um, uh, Lev Lupkovsky, uh, I think his name is. Sorry, I'm not focusing very well on that. That's better, yeah. Um, it's called uh, The Vyazma Catastrophe, The Red Army's Disaster Stand Against Operation Typhoon. Um, I'll be blunt and say it's it's the best book I've ever read on the Soviets' perspective, the story, the, well, yeah, the Soviets' perspective, or the Russians' perspective on... Um, what happened? And he basically just rips the Kri the Krivishi figures. Um, his father died in in this battle, which motivated him to find out what happened. And it'd be fantastic if you could have him on your show. <laughs> I don't know. If he's probably in Russia. Anyway, um, he he came up with him and another couple of. He used uh, two other uh, uh, scholars, Nev Nevzorov and Mikhailov. To, more Russian uh, scholars, and they they basically went to the uh, the Russian archives, the TSMO files. They did an analysis of all the Russian strengths, and they found that um, the 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 you know well over a million men died in this. Uh, sorry, were were lost in this this uh, three week period. Um, so so basically, I've 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 then decided you know okay, I'll put these numbers in and and. Um, in my in the book that I published two years ago, I actually put a lot of detail on these five, on these six, these the four battles there. The the bottom one is just Kursk. I threw that in because I just thought, well, I'll throw one in just to see what the numbers are like, you know, later in the war, <clears throat> to see if they're and they're not bad actually. The the figures there are mainly from Glantz's work, uh, Glantz and House's book on on Kursk. So I thought, well, I'll I'll work out uh, what theirs were, and you can see they're not actually so bad. Um, mm. So again, it's it's you know the, the Krivishev study somehow 1941 early 42 they really don't want to tell you what happened. <laughs> um, they just but but they do get better 42 43 44 their figures actually are, are, are more in line with with the, um, I think with what happened from the bit of but I'm finding that the um, the 41 battle. So these four battle, these five battles here, I've, I've basically shown with the new new research on the right. Kiev, just to mention, for example, um, the Kiev Russian history includes the Uman pocket. So the Uman pocket was a big battle in the you know, in the Ukraine where around around 100,000 Soviet soldiers were killed. It was a very bloody battle, and another 100,000 were were taken POWs. Pretty much destructed, you know, the, destroyed three armies in that battle. And that's included in the Battle of Kiev. The, the Kiev strategic defensive operation figures go for 82 days, and it includes that whole Uman pocket um, 
uh, battle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't, again, I can't help, I'm very cynical about, about what they've done here. So they've, they've basically bundled all these buckets into this historiography and then and underestimated the losses. So, and they, again, they've reversed engineering to get down to this 3 million 1941 figure. So it's kind of working backwards again. And no, you know, if you say, no, throw all that away, this is the new data. And I have to say that this is not stuff I've made up. This is, this is Russian scholars in the last 10 years who've, who've come up with, you know, with these figures. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, they're even more scathing of Krivoshev than I am. They, they're really pissed off that these men are basically not even recognized that they, you know, and, and, and they have a point because it basically, you, you're talking about a couple of million Red Army soldiers that are not even being acknowledged, that they didn't even, you know, their contribution has not even been acknowledged, that they, you know, they, they, they paid the ultimate sacrifice against the odds. At least they could be recorded. So anyway, that's so I'll jump ahead. Um, so if we now adjust, we go back to table nine and we adjust now these these seven major, uh, um, or five, in this case, the four major operations out of the seven. We come up with these numbers. So Again, I've put the Krivoshev numbers in orange, and now you can see we're up, we're 127 percent of irrecoverable, and we're 190 percent of Krivoshev's figures All for right. the for the totals. Um, but using the new data, which you know, a reevaluation of total Soviet losses in '94 of 6.4 million, which we'll talk about tomorrow in Table 15, it now comes out to 83. Again, that fits. So if we use this revised data on, on these strategic operations, you know, we're getting to 83% of, 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 the, um, of, the, of the total losses in 1941. And they, they were the bloodiest battles. You know, the, the Kiev, yeah. the Typhoon, yeah. uh, by, a long, by a long margin. So that's kind of it for strategic operations. Well, I mean, I, it's it's just brilliant stuff, and I'm I'm still processing it mentally and 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 the mathematics behind it all. But it's you know, case presented very well, and um and I, I'm I'm very excited about the idea of you coming back and talking about the efficiency of German armor <laughs> divisions because that's that's light up my street. That is, to be honest. But um, yeah, well, yeah, well, well I'll just remind folks that, of course, I, I mentioned at the beginning of yesterday's show the links to Nigel's website are in the description below. There's a whole host of books. How many how many volumes is it? Uh, uh, there's five there at the moment. So look, I, I don't want to finish just there. I just want to do the yep, last sure. two, two slides. Yeah, um, no problem. I'm just, I'm just, then, I'm just processing that. We'll go back and we'll continue. But yeah, no, it's that. Uh, so I'm um, reminding viewers to go and check out Nigel's website. Yeah, look, that there's there's five books. Uh, the first one is a is a methodology book based just talking about using quantitative methodology and mathematical treatment of weapon systems. The first, the second two volumes are about the German side, and the last two volumes about the Soviet. So they're basically right. focused on 1941, yeah. And we've got a question for you before you about when is when is volume six could to be expected? That's from uh, <laughs> Django um, 32. I, yeah, I'm working on volume six. It's um, um, volume six is 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 volume five was going to be about the German allies with the Romanians, the Hungarians, Finns, Slovakians, and Italians. But I've put that on hold, and in volume six is going to be talking about um, it's going to be talking about the relative overall combat proficiencies of the Soviet and German forces on the East Front in World War Two. Um, it's it's going to be a pretty advanced study of using different methodologies like QJM, um, different types of attrition differential equations to to uh, to calculate combat efficiencies based on losses, strengths, things like weapon systems will be in there and all that stuff. I've been working on it for about a year. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of big. It'll have all the German losses, all the Soviet losses, um, but it also, to do this, I need all the equipment losses as well. So it'll have all the German equipment losses, Soviet equipment losses. Yeah. So that'll be the next volume six. It's 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 going to be um, it's a very difficult book to do actually. Um, it's it's really employing a lot of the military operations research which I have been learning and and, and practicing professionally for the last couple of years. Right. Okay. Um, 
so that's that's um it's going to be a year, at least a year and a half yeah okay probably. thank you well thank you for that so so yeah. anyway uh just to cut into next uh, to what we're going to do tomorrow this is basically we've, we've finished the part one and i just wanted to cover off these last two slides covering equipment losses so these 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 last two slides are actually two of my favorite slides uh because they they are this other data stream that i that i mentioned um so here we have information again from the Krivish chief study on the total losses of equipment and um for each for each year up to the total for the war so this is none of this is german figures this is entirely official russian figures as of today and we can look here in 1941 they lost five and a half million rifles and carbines now don't tell me exactly how they calculated that because let any other parts of krivishiv study they actually do have the equipment losses for each of the major operations and if you add them all up you do actually come up with with these numbers so that's pretty impressive actually that they've so what's interesting here is if we go back to what i was talking about you know hitler claiming twenty thousand tanks well if we go to the next slide under tanks you can see that the russians admit to losing twenty thousand five hundred tanks in 1941 so they lost approximately seventeen thousand three hundred of the light tanks t26s 900 kvs and two two thousand three hundred t34s so they lost over three thousand t34 and kv tanks in 1941 and um if you look at the total artillery figures um 24,000, you know, lost. The Germans included anti-aircraft guns and anti-tank guns in their figures. So, because they were talking about just guns. So when you add those up, you come up with, you know, even more than the 33,000 the Germans claimed. The Germans also claimed 17, I think, thousand aircraft. You know, back in, this is in Hitler's speech. And in fact, we find that the Russians today admit to the loss of 21,000 aircraft wow. in 1941. So again, why would the Germans underestimate their equipment losses, the, the Soviet the equipment loss, if, and then do the same for, you know, overestimate the POWs? Just, so people think, well, German losses for POWs, I don't believe the Germans. Well, it doesn't make sense that they would be so accurate with their equipment accounting and then their POWs would be would be exaggerated. It, it, why would they do that? You know, and, and you've got to think of it from the German point of view. They weren't interested in post-war, what was happening. They, they, they thought they were going to win the war. So, you know, they just wanted to um, produce figures that would, would help them do that. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 you know, I don't see this mismatch between the German data and, and, uh, and a whole bunch of other data streams. Now, what's interesting here as well is that um, if, for example, Krivashev says that he's have a three million irrecoverable losses in 1941. So you then got to say, well, how can you lose three million soldiers and five and a half million rifles? That doesn't make mm. sense. That just doesn't make sense. Because um, even though yesterday I talked about the divisions being equipment heavy and not being at full strength, even when you account for that, it's still, you know, so it might be. It might be, you know, 1.3, 1.4 rifles per man. It's still not going to be, you know, two or, or two and a half or whatever. And then, of course, only a portion of, the, of, of that three million would have been carrying rifles. The others would have been in tanks and artillery yep. And, yep. and so on. So, in fact, it's even worse than that. So what I thought, I thought what I'd do is just, this is this is analysis that I did. I came up with these multiplier factors um, based on, on uh previous information so so actually from other campaigns i found that roughly between 1.2 and 1.3 small arms or would be lost per man um and and i started coming up with these numbers so the the, the factor is really equipment per man if you like um or, and the reciprocal of that is 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 you know uh 
yeah, the opposite of that. <clears throat> so, so basically, that that equates to roughly 1.3, 1, you know, 1.3 rifles per per soldier in 41. Now, because the, the divisions in 1941 saw equipment heavy, they I decided to adjust those for 41 and then an average for the rest of the war. So, basically, the the the, the two things on the on the left, one is just for 41, and, and the one on the right is basically just. Uh, an estimated average for the for the uh, for the whole war because I was sort of thinking, well, just to, just to get an idea. And again, this is this is not this is not um, there's nothing concrete about this. This is just a, an analysis I did to see if 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 there was a mismatch between the equipment losses and the human losses, and obviously there is. Um, and on the next slide, you can see at the bottom that if you if you uh, do this analysis, you should come up with a figure of around 5.2 million. Um, Irrecoverable losses for the for the forty one, and that's actually less than six point. Um, was it three or four we'll be using? But it's actually about two. It's about two million more than Krivoshev produces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, but yeah. so and and again for the total war it comes out at fourteen million. So in Table One, if you remember, Krivoshev admits to the uh, eleven point four million uh, irrecoverable loss. You add the three million POWs that we've we've basically said. Should be there. You yeah. come up with this forty million. So, so in fact, if you do if you do the analysis, the the, the irrecoverable losses that the, that the Red Army sustained of around forty million matches their equipment losses. Um, okay, some people say, "Well, I'm doing a bit of clever work here," but but yeah, admittedly that's true. But on the other hand, you've got to account for these equipment losses because these are enormous equipment losses. And I'm actually this, these these scaling factors are actually pretty conservative, you know. For example, I'm saying uh, for the average tank lost, you know, uh, you, you, in 41 you lost two, you know, two men. Um, for the average bomber, for example, you lost two men. So I'm, I'm basically saying the bulk of the people who are in a tank or in a bomber survived, but you know, it, it, when you do the numbers. Um, Rifles just and tanks just don't fall into enemy hands without loss. And um, I'm assuming you've you've so, you've you know we don't want to talk about what you do for a day a day job, but you've compared this data for other armies and other wars, and there are kind of some kind of references you can you can make to, to there, there are what am I trying to say? There are there are formulas that you can kind of look at that are kind of constant across countries and wars. Yeah. Um, so so you know in the Iraq War. Um, the Iraqi army left behind huge amounts of equipment, um, which, and if you tally up the total equipment that, that was left behind and their, and their losses, you get you get numbers which are not that dissimilar to World War II. Right. Um, nobody nobody piled up equipment in in warehouses for the for the for the enemy to come along and capture. I mean that, you know, that just didn't happen. The vast majority of weapons that were captured in the war were operational at some point. Um, so. If a tank was if a tank was destroyed, you know, if it was a Sherman tank hit by an eighty eight, unfortunately, quite a significant portion of the crew would be killed usually. Um, but a lot of tanks were just abandoned because you know they broke down. So in that yeah. case, the entire tank crew walked away, and yet the tank was captured. So you know, on average, basically, you you you've got to assess. Well, okay, on an average battle in a modern war. You know what? What kind of personnel are you going to expecting to lose for for losing valuable equipment? Um, the interesting thing about this is is that these numbers by Krivichev are incredibly you know useful. They're actually this is really useful information that he's supplying. And also, the other thing I just want to point out is this equipment is irrecoverable losses. This is not a, this is not repaired equipment. I've heard people say, oh well, of that twenty thousand five hundred lost in nineteen forty one. That includes damaged tanks. Put it back. No, this the numbers listed here are permanent losses. So the Russians lost twenty thousand five hundred tanks. They were gone from the Russian inventory, the Soviet inventory. You know that was the end of it. They were they were. Um, if you if you if you include damaged tanks, you could probably multiply that by two and a half. And that's why it's so risky to use. Like if some units say, "Oh, we killed you know five hundred Russian tanks." Probably 250 were totally destroyed. But if the Russians, this, you know, the Red Army captured the battlefield, then then basically um, 
probably 200 to 250 those tanks will be put back into service at some point. So really the losses are 250. But this is irrecoverable losses tallied up at the end of the war. And again, I, I didn't just uh, I didn't just leave it at that. I actually compared it to the production. So Krivyshev supplies figures for production. And there are also other sources for from uh, Soviet material production during the war. And so you can say, well, okay, you know, they lost 83,500 tanks in the war. They lost another 12,960, you know, self-propelled, fully tracked AFVs, uh, SU series. That, you know, that equates to, what, 96,000. Does Is that real? Did the Russians make that many tanks? Well, yeah, they did, actually. They produced... You know, over uh, with the tanks before the war, it comes out at 105,000. So, in fact, right. the Soviets ended the war with around six and a half, seven thousand tanks still in the field. Again, the manufacturing data stream matches the loss here, and so on. So, these loss figures um, are, you know, are pretty, pretty, um, pretty accurate from from various data streams. Now, I just want to say that I have, in fact, loaded these PDFs. This this the, this presentation has been loaded onto my website. So if people want these, this data, they just go to um, operationbarbaros.net and there's a heading there called blog, my blog, and there's a link to the PDF. So they I will add that yeah. fully to the description as soon as you're finished, so, we're finished today. So I'll do that. No so problem. yeah, that, that pretty much covers today. So tomorrow we'll talk about the, uh, the RF, TSMO, RF, which is the... Um, Central Archive Ministry of Defense files, which is which is basically using that to establish irrecoverable losses and not uh, co uh, not Krivyshev's front and combat uh, front and HQ report system, and then we'll talk a bit about uh, re-evaluation the of, of Russian of Soviet losses during the the whole war, a bit about how that fits into the, the, the demography, the whole population, and then just compare it to some of the uh, the German losses and and some of the Allied losses. So that, right. that'll be tomorrow yeah brilliant so anyway, well, yeah i'm looking forward to tomorrow so folks i'll just take you off screen for a second folks we've got a non-eastern front show tonight Stephen lossad is joining me to do the operation cobra show about general bradley in that uh, that we had to cancel back in july because we had internet problems at his end but he's back today theoretically we've got to do a test this afternoon so that will be bradley's handling operation cobra it will sit and dovetail very nicely with the show we did the following day of the day was meant to be scheduled with Kevin Hemel about Middleton's eighth course smashing down towards Avranche. So that will kind of finish off that opera, Operation Cobra uh, set of shows from July. And then tomorrow, Nigel will be back again in the morning if you're in the UK. And then we have Wendy Goldman on tomorrow evening for the Soviet civilian experience and how they pushed back all their factories, which I'm really looking forward to because Wendy Goldman's book was, was really quite amazing. So I'll just bring Nigel back in to say goodbye and we'll, we'll see you again tomorrow. Yeah. Adieu until tomorrow. It's been brilliant again. So thanks, everybody, thanks for watching. Lot. See you all tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.